so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I'm very excited about this uh, webinar and I promise one of the things we're going to do that's atypical from other webinars because uh, I, I think over the, since the pandemic, we've kind of webinared ourselves into a place of, of kind of mind numbing webinar success. We are just going to literally make this fun. Uh, we've got the right honorable Mike Dungies, who is a product sales specialist for New York, uh, but but he covers uh, the Meraki portfolio. And I'm going to start with a quick story. And I know I I'm going to completely do everything wrong, but I think that there's a point in, in presenting this way. Uh, I spent the first half of my career in education, uh, both at K-12 and higher ed. And I'm going to tell you a quick story, and I'll tell you another one a little bit later, but they have to do with... Uh, what we're talking about sensors and cameras for a safer higher education environment. Uh, I was working at a particular uh, institution where overnight a pipe on the second floor of one of the buildings burst. And we're not talking about, you know, the, the pipe that connects to your sink or your toilet. We're talking massive pipe. And although there's supposed to be somebody who goes from building to building and checking on things at night, that didn't happen. Uh, and so you can imagine eight hours of uninterrupted water flow uh, would be catastrophic, and it was. You're not just dealing with having to call students and tell them, sorry, classes are not being offered tomorrow. You also have to figure out how you're gonna make up for that loss of educational learning, where are your staff going to go who are preparing plans, where are meetings going to take place, and then you have to go through the process of hiring contractors to come in and literally take out everything from carpet to furniture to anything that's made of wood or wood product, uh, and then mold mitigation. It is a complete disaster. And the irony about this story, and this was literally 12 years ago that this happened, is that they now make, Rocky has a sensor. It's wildly inexpensive and Mike can talk more about this, but there's a sensor that would have notified somebody within minutes of this happening. And you could have avoided all of this aggravation and it ultimately took three months to get back to business as usual. Uh, and so there are these stories that just uh, uh, permeate the education industry. And obviously, as higher ed is changing more and more, it's becoming more hybrid, more flexible, opening its doors to new and different programs. Uh, so much of what's taking place is becoming a blended infrastructure. Uh, and so I'm really excited about this conversation. I'm really excited to have Mike on uh, because, again, he is the person uh, who can really give us some background into what's out there and really what's at the forefront of technology for Meraki. Uh, and so, Mike, uh, welcome. I appreciate you joining. I appreciate you coming to share. And, and let's do this. For those who have heard Meraki and go, oh, I've heard of it, uh, maybe Cisco, part of Cisco, not part of Cisco. Tell me a little bit about Meraki in general. Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks for the intro, Jared. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about what Mar like, I hate to do this. I told you I was yep. going to screw everything up. Uh, I have to just make a quick comment. I do work for Aspire. There you go. That's important, Mike, because what you do, we bring right to the customers and help them perfect. And so you can see everything from enterprise networks, collaboration, cybersecurity, IoT, mobility, data center, and cloud, all of these things we do really, really well. We are a value-added reseller. Uh, we have some of the best minds in the industry who are able to go out. You can see all of the wonderful awards we have. Obviously, tons of them uh, through Cisco Meraki. Uh, so that makes it only fitting that we have the best product sales specialist in all of Meraki teamed up with, frankly, the best uh, account manager at Aspire. Uh, and uh, here we are. So go ahead again, Mike. Tell right. me a little bit. Meraki, hit me. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. And I appreciate the accolades. Best product sales specialist. There's a lot of us in the company. So that's a, that's a hell of an achievement. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, um, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this. We're we're gonna gonna go over the overall benefits uh, today. We're gonna talk about physical security and safety and security. We're gonna talk about use cases just like Jared's example of that pipe bursting and how we can use environmental sensors that were originally designed for um, data centers and technology, uh, you know, users and advocates to even manage all the way out to every aspect of facilities management and how we can keep an eye on things happening in our physical plant, as we might call it, uh, throughout the infrastructure, but do it in a secure way so that people have access to the resources that they need without having to have access to the management tools that we use in the technology space. So we'll touch on all of that. Uh, let's talk about Meraki for a little bit, like Jared said. So 
Meraki is a cloud-first technology company that was acquired by Cisco in 2012. I joined Cisco in 2014, so Meraki had already been integrated to some degree into the Cisco ecosystem. But the main reason, from my perspective, um, that that Cisco picked Meraki out of all of the different technologies that were available out there uh, in the field is because they had a really unique vision of how technology should work. And it was simple, simple, simple. I had a great example today that complexity is really uh, alluring, but it's not what people are willing to use. People don't want to use complexity when they have the time. There's, there's an allure to understanding how things work and being able to get in there and twist the nerd knobs, as we say. But when you simplify something and give people time back in their schedule to go do other things, uh, that's the biggest value that people find. Jared, did you want to say, jump in there? Well, I was just going to tell onto this. We've seen this through the pandemic, and, and I know you'll talk a little bit about this. We're stretching the, the, the human capital of IT departments thin. And in higher ed, it really is about getting out there and helping the staff, the students, the administrators utilize technology, not managing it. And, and that's the really cool thing about Meraki. We've all heard the saying, a single pane of glass. I mean, it's really become that easy. And so, again, it, it, to your point, it's helping us do the things that are the objectives of our organization. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. So the, the goal here and what you'll see as I go through my demo later today uh, in the session is that everything from the design of the back end system that we'll talk about just here in a minute to the way that you, the user, would interact with this, the goal is to keep it as simple and easy to use as possible. There's a lot of complexity here. There is a lot of technology. There's a lot of things going on in the background that make this all work, but that shouldn't have to be a concern in your day-to-day -day operation of the platform. So we'll go over that as we go through it. So here's the first piece um, to, to the Meraki puzzle. We were built in the cloud. So Meraki was originally designed as a cloud platform. It was designed at MIT. And the idea of it was they didn't have good internet access throughout the housing at the MIT campuses, this was back in the day, right? And if you did want it, you'd have to buy your own connection. And if you bought your own connection, that meant that you got to use it and no one else did, right? So uh, a couple of geniuses came up with a way to share, they called it RoofNet, share between buildings, this great wireless relay infrastructure. And even today, the algorithms that they used for our wireless meshing then are the same algorithms that we still use today in our Meraki wireless mesh. But we've grown so much more beyond that. But the basis of what that was originally, this cloud management system that allowed those devices to talk to each other with no additional need from the user input, and the ability to manage all those things through the dashboard of the single pane of glass, which I'll show you today, um, is still there and still inherent with the base of the technology. However, over the last few years, we've expanded our portfolio. So you can see we have everything from wireless and switching all the way out to environmental sensors and cameras across the full spectrum of what you would consider network and uh, manageable technology. But while we did that expansion, what we realized is what you can get for data in the dashboard and that simplicity that we put in there isn't enough, right? It's, it's not enough for a lot of power users that want that extra little kick um, of information or ability to manage. So we opened up our APIs and now we have over a billion API requests a day hitting our dashboards for different points of data. Uh, and, and we'll talk about how that applies directly to the environmental sensors and the cameras later because that those API integration points are really, really nice to get data into other systems um, that may not be an IT system, but may be a facilities management system. So we can talk about how those things integrate and work together. So we don't let you just play. We let you play, grow, expand, and build on the Meraki platform, just like you see with almost any cloud platform that's out there today. So <clears throat> access from anywhere. We put this in here when the pandemic first kicked off, and this still resonates as the truest form of uh, how to solve problems. I've been a network engineer up until I came to Cisco. I was a network engineer for a mining company for uh major higher ed system in Massachusetts at one point. I was, I've covered the, the gamut of different types of customers um, using technology. And if I wanted to access my networks from home, I'd either have to VPN in, or if my network was down, 
it was out of band management through cellular gateways or third party devices to get into my network infrastructure. Because we're designed from the ground up and be, as a cloud infrastructure, you can come in to the, your network infrastructure from anywhere. Someone calls you up, that pipe bursts at two o'clock in the morning and your network gears offline because it's soaked. You got the alert, first of all, from us, which is hopefully what happens, right? That the pipe burst or that there's a water issue. And secondly, you can start troubleshooting any of those issues all from the convenience of your iPhone, right? We have great apps to show you what's going on. If you need a little more detail, a little more control, hop on the laptop, log in and, and get full control over those network devices. And we'll show you how that works here in a few minutes. But again, all of that comes from the, the mentality that Meraki, the Meraki platform is a cloud first platform. And that ties back into what we were talking about with the APIs and the dashboard. So some of the numbers, um, just to show you where we're at and where we've come since Cisco's acquired Meraki in 2012, we have over 3 million customer networks. So that's, we have a, we have a ton of customers, but that equates to over 3 million networks globally. Um, 10 million online Meraki devices throughout those 3 million networks. We're, over, we're in over 190 countries with a billion of those API requests a day. I mean, that's, oh, sorry, a week. I apologize. That's, I, should, I should correct that statement, but it is weekly requests. So, uh, you know, 150 million requests a day, maybe. Um, 150 million daily end user devices. So the, the, that means that me as a user on a network, I'm one of those 150 million devices on those Meraki networks worldwide. We support that many devices. And, and this is all again through that cloud platform. And we can show you why and how valuable that end user device data is in a minute. <clears throat> and then the splash daily splash pages served, it's a really interesting stat. When you look at things like Meraki Wireless, when you go, log into the dashboard and see what's happening to constantly be able to sustain new connections and new interactions through that through that metric is is huge. And what that does is that shows the resiliency and scalability of what we can put out there for our customers. That's a very good number when it comes to can we scale? Yes, that's growing every day still to this point. And, and Mike, while you're talking about that, all of those things tie back into the Talos uh, security portfolio, if you will, which you know is industry leading in its ability to provide cybersecurity metrics and, and prevention. That is a fantastic transition, Jared. Thank you very much. That's perfect. So if you I'm look, the for. first, the first, uh, first, you know, part of this slide is security. So everything that Meraki does ties back into that Talos ecosystem, as Jared said. So Talos is a a branch of our company that is constantly going out there, finding vulnerabilities, working with companies to patch those vulnerabilities, pulling updates, looking at malware, understanding what's happening on the internet, and assessing essentially every single threat. And Talos also has access and visibility into 95% of internet traffic at one point or another. So we see what's happening everywhere in the world and we can take that intelligence and immediately add it to those Meraki devices. So we know if an IP address becomes a bad actor and we don't let it talk to your camera. We know that this um, fingerprint from this piece of activity, even if it's on a secure HTTPS port, we know that that type of activity represents uh, the fingerprint of a piece of malware. And we can tell you that that's happening and, and allow you to block that or just based on your policy, maybe even block it for you automatically. So all of that intelligence back there that's, that is essentially in the Meraki platform comes from that Talos engine that, that Jared referenced. Super reliable, super scalable. The reliability piece for me is big. It goes beyond just the hardware. Yes, it works. Yes, this is based on Cisco technology. There's a ton of merchant silicon in this too, which means that we can keep the, the costs on the Meraki platform hardware low. But the reliability, our enterprise level support team is 100% fantastic. If you have a Meraki wireless access point, a Meraki camera or sensor, and it's licensed, there's a warranty on that that basically says we'll get it to you in the next 24 hours, regardless of the issue. Our turnaround times are super fast. You can step that up a little bit with different contracts, but the default license allows you to get that device turned around in under 24 hours. So you're back up and running really quickly. So not just reliable in the hardware sense, but reliable from a, 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 an entire ecosystem. And then the future proofing, this is, I'll say this, and then we're probably gonna dive into the demo almost right after this. The day you buy a Meraki piece of hardware, and 
sign on with that Meraki license is the dumbest day that product will ever be. Uh, the dumbest that product will ever be on that day. What that means is that every single day our teams are working on improving even the hardware that you have on-prem, right? Even the dashboard that you use on a daily basis. New features come out all the time. New firmware updates come out all the time. You can actually really schedule those things down so that you're not interrupting services on the infrastructure. But we are constantly, just like your iPhone, just like your Android, just like Windows with Windows updates, we've taken the concept of being able to update your infrastructure on the fly to the network level and to the sensor level, which allows you to always have the, the, the best experience moving forward. Things like Wi-Fi 6 to Wi-Fi 6E, that requires a new piece of hardware. But if we're talking about better algorithms to analyze your Wi-Fi traffic and give you better performance within those bands, that happens every day with new new uh, updates that we come out with. So keep keep that in mind as we talk about and go through what we're going to look at today on the sensors and the cameras. By the way, if you have any questions, you can feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, Kathleen and Jared and I will go through those questions when we get to the end and, and we can kind of answer those as we go. <clears throat> So to kick it off, this is the Meraki dashboard. Now I want to show you something. Remember I mentioned earlier, actually I'll even go back to the slide. Um, we have over 3 million customer networks, right? So this is what that looks like. Each one of these green dots is a customer network somewhere in the world. Um, some of them are out in the middle of the ocean. Part of that is because we have a, a few customer networks on cruise ships. Part of that is because people have not appropriately, in this case, set their geolocation of their wireless access points. But you get the general idea. The, the, we are blanketed across the world. We are pretty much everywhere. And um, these networks, every one of those green dots represents a customer network that, that is in use today at this time. New Zealand, look at that. We blanket New Zealand. They like us, apparently. So... <laughs> Uh, to switch back, this is what you get to see. For those of you who don't have a daily interaction with Meraki, this is what you get to see when you log into the Meraki dashboard. When you first log in and you choose the network that you're going to work on, this is the view that you come to. And I love to spend just a few minutes on this. This isn't necessarily the sensors or the cameras, but this is the general view. And if you're using us for any network devices whatsoever, I love this page because it's about the utilization. Once you put Meraki in place, once it's configured, it's no longer about day-to-day -day configuration. It's about consumption of the information about what's happening in your environment. So this is that page. This tells us what our clients are doing. This tells us the health of our devices, right? So I've got 143 switches and 147 of them, uh, 147 switches and 143 are healthy. And I can just very quickly drill into that data and see what's going on. But today, like I said, we're gonna be dealing with cameras and sensors. So if you're interested in seeing this and seeing how this operates on your network, reach out to Jared and his team, and we can certainly do a deeper dive on the full Meraki dashboard. So I'm going to jump directly over to our video wall here. We're going to start with the cameras. So the reason I do this, so before coming to the Meraki side of Cisco, I was on the IoT side, the Internet of Things side of Cisco. And we sold a ton of cameras in Internet of Things. And the reason is the camera is one of the best sensors you can have. It is an optical sensor, and the intelligence behind that sensor is the data that you would get from any other device. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about water, you know, water detection sensors and moisture and humidity and air quality. All of that's part of our sensor portfolio. But these cameras are also sensors. We can detect people. We can detect objects. We can detect motion and all of these things that are important to understanding those facilities and those spaces as well. So what we're looking at here first is our visual view, our human interaction with these cameras, which is our video wall. And in this case, we're looking at the bike entryway. This is our San Francisco office. Uh, you can see there's not that many bikes in here. When pre-pandemic, this thing was is loaded with bikes every day. And people go in and out all the time. So we wanted to keep an eye on that for people in case bikes went missing. And this is the actual bike room itself. Um, by the way, one thing to notice when we're looking at these cameras is you see up here, I've got this little cloud. This camera, when I first load the, the video wall, I'm trying to talk to that camera directly. If I'm on the same network infrastructure as the camera, if I have the same IP address range, if we're behind the same router and same firewall, all in the same environment, 
I don't go to the cloud for any of the video data. It's instantly coming to my machine. However, I'm sitting in Vermont. These cameras are in San Francisco. So I get this little cloud logo shows me that I'm getting a cloud proxy stream, which means the video is going up to the cloud, coming back down, and then it proxies the connection and tries to get me direct to that camera through an HTTPS port. So there is still a path for me to this camera through a cloud proxy. In this case, I can click on any of these cameras, zoom in, and I can scroll down here and you can see this green bar. This is where there was probably some activity where it actually recorded changes in the room. I can click on that. I can move to a different time. I can let that load and it'll play what's happening in that space at that time. And Mike, we have other if, Go ahead, Jerry. If, if you've ever sat and had to look at video, and I've been there, uh, I had to look at hours of video. Having something as simple as that little green activity tab at the yeah. bottom, letting you know, uh, it, it is tremendously helpful. And correct me if I'm wrong, the cameras are constantly on, but right. from an energy perspective, it's not always recording until there is an action. Yeah, depending on how we set them. We can set cameras to record 100% of the time, or we can set record cameras to record only on motion. So what's really cool is when we record on motion, we're always kind of recording... I guess the way we do it is you, we're kind of recording everything and then we're dumping data. Think of it like a DVR in your house, right? Like you can rewind 15 minutes into any show that you change the channel to, but you can't really go back any further. So you can see this person walking by, that's motion. So what we would do in the algorithm is we say, okay, now that I see motion, I want the 15 seconds before and the 30 seconds after. And we save a whole clip because we, we never really turn that off. That way, the way that old systems used to work is the camera would see motion and then it would start recording and you miss like the first five seconds of what's happening, which is not necessarily what you want. So we always have this running buffer, which is great. So what you saw is you could just see a person walking by uh, on the platform here, which is great because we do have some activity in the office today, it looks like. So then I can zoom in to this particular camera. And if I come down here, let's see if I can, what I could do is see that motion again, right? And I can actually watch, let's see, what time is it? It is 8.28 a.m. I could probably watch that person walk by again here in just a second. I don't know what time. What time do we actually have on the actual clock? So it's one minute. So this is one minute back. So it's still buffering. What you will see on these cameras is that when I see a lot of motion, I'll get this orange bar underneath. And I'm not seeing it right here, but I'll show you on a couple of different views. Um, I'll get this orange bar underneath. So what Jared was saying is, instead of having to go through all of this green and look for all of that actual motion, we can show you where the motion was highlighted. Now, in order to do that, let me jump over to my cameras here. So we're looking at the fourth, fourth floor staircase. So I can jump directly to the fourth floor staircase camera. Now I've moved out of the video wall at this point, and we know that because up here on the top space, all of my menus have changed, right? So no longer can I click through my video walls. Now I can click through the camera, uh, the camera configuration. And there are those orange bars I talked about. And I can highlight that orange bar and I can see that person walking. That's not 20 people. That's one person walking down the stairs and the motion all in one thumbnail. So when I click on that, it's going to load the video. And now here's the person walking down the stairs, right? And right around the corner. Now, What's really cool about that is I want to share that clip. That was a bad actor. I just come up here real quick and I can hit, take a screenshot and take a still, or I can click share and I can share the link externally directly to where my cursor is, where that video starts. So I can take this and send it. What's that? She did look suspicious. She was very suspicious. <laughs> But I can take that link and share it directly with a resource officer, the city police department, all through a link. Now you have control over those links. That shows up in an audit log. I can even show you in the event log who's looked at that from the standpoint of like, did somebody click on the link that was shared and what were they able to do? Or I can export a video clip right from here. So it'll download it from the camera and create a video clip and then you can share that. Can't track that as well. Right, I can track a link through my audit log. Once I export the clip, it's not trackable. So you have two different ways to do it depending on how you want to manage that, right? Um, so again, we talked about earlier the sensor version, right? So now I'm talking about human interaction, capturing video, seeing what's happening. So how is this camera a sensor? Well, when I go to my analytics page, I can actually use, these cameras are all running the people counting algorithm. So I can see that at this time, 
between six and nine, there were eight people. Now, it could be the same person walking in and out of frame eight, eight times, but there were eight people counted in that frame during that period of time. There was 18 people counted in this frame during that period of time. Now, we're looking at, at that in the dashboard format. And if I click on that, I can drill down and get even more detailed. I can drill down to this where it says three. And again, maybe it was the same person three times, but what that does is that allows me to have metadata on what's actually happening. Now, I can take that metadata, export it to a third-party app, something that maybe monitors a conference room. You put a camera in this conference room and it detects 20 people in the conference room at the same time. Because once they're in frame and they don't leave frame, that count, that, that, that count will follow that person. It won't double up. And what that does is now I can set an alert and say, you know what, this conference room is only rated for 10 people with the new COVID rules that we have. Why are there 20 people in there? All that, say so we were watching that person walk by right there. So all of that data, that's a sensor right there. Go ahead, Jared. And let me just comment on that too, because I think one of the things that gets lost in some of the conversations we have from the sales perspective is an administrator. And I'm scheduling is the single most important activity that takes place in any educational institution because you're trying to put bodies in rooms. And when you have the access, right? We often think of cameras are in the IT department, but if we can take that data and, and start looking at where we're scheduling, where people are, where people need to be. Now we know uh, for future reference, uh, maybe what time we're offering certain classes, what time we have lecture halls being occupied, what time do we need to have uh, maybe even a security person uh, on duty. Maybe we're trying to figure out where to put vending machines. And, and some of this stuff becomes very granular, but it is really foundational to what we're doing from a scheduling perspective, a facilities perspective, an operational perspective, uh, even where we're sending our cleaning folks. It was, it, it's always been typical to say at night, we're going to send somebody through and clean That's the right. fourth floor. Well, what if you knew that only five people walked through there? You wouldn't need to do it on such a reoccurring basis. And it begins to formulate a new way of looking at how we're doing things, like I said, like operations, security, facilities. The list starts going on and on. And again, I think that master scheduling piece really resonates with a lot of the curriculum administrators, the presidents, uh, the deans who sit there and say, I need to know where to put people. Yeah, absolutely. So in Texas, we did this with these cameras. And it was actually not, it's taking your scheduling example to the next level, Jared. We put these cameras outside. We have outdoor cameras and we watched where people parked and then we followed them across the campus. And what we found is that just because of the scheduling, people had to park halfway across campus, walk halfway across campus to a class where there was a parking lot right next to the class that they were going to. But they couldn't park there because that parking lot was full because the, the way the schedules were done. So we were able to take and reschedule classes in different locations. We were able to take and put availability of parking spaces into this algorithm and very quickly determine is if we if we either make this class five minutes later, start five minutes later, or put it because it has the variability, it's not a lab, put it in this building instead we can actually get people to park right next to the building where they're going to be going. Close. It's just a better user experience for the folks that are paying money to be there. Absolutely. hundred percent. So this is the visual sensor. Now I know we're, 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 there's a lot of information in a short time. So I'm going to hop over to our other sensors as well and kind of talk about some of the examples that Jared were, was going over earlier. So right here on the left-hand side, and I'll, I'll touch on this while I'm doing this, what you'll notice is whether you're using our security devices, our switches, our cameras, even our environmental sensors, these menus are designed again with that intelligence of simplicity in mind. If I go here, everything is under monitor on the left, configure on the right. The reason is, is once you configure these things, you're not going to go there as much. You're not going to go to configure unless you need to make a change. So why would we put the configure menu on the left if that's the easiest way to get there? So we put the thing you're going to use the most, the closest to where your mouse is already. That, and that level of intelligence and these guys who developed that just still flabbergast me today. So I'm going to look at our environmental sensors and I want to go to our overview right now. now. I don't have anything in the configure menu because I'm not an administrator on this network. I'm a read-only user. So I don't even have the ability to look at the configuration of these devices, but I do have the ability to look at the sensors themselves and show you what's going on. So this is the overview. This is all of my sensor data on one page, right? And this is for the last day. I can change my time frame 
for the last two hours, the last day, the last week, or set a custom range. In this case, I'm just going to say the last 30 days. This will take a second to load and update but because <clears throat> I'm on a demo dashboard. Now, it's real data, but we have a separate dashboard for demos. And what you'll see is, while I'm waiting for this to, to some of these things to update, um, I've got the sensor alerts. Um, I'm going to, all the profiles that I'm looking at, alert profiles, that all the sensors are using this. I've got this entrance door, don't alert. There's only one sensor using that profile, and I can show you how we dig into that. But these conference rooms, I have 110 sensors in my conference rooms at this location, and they're using this profile. So if I dig into this profile, I can say any sensor with this profile attached. This is what I want it to do. If the temperature goes above 80 degrees, for any length of time or below 60 degrees for any length of time, we're going to send an email alert to the facilities department so that they know that there's something going on in that conference room when it comes to the temperature. Now, why is that important? Well, in an environment like this, when that temperature gets to an incubation rate and our viral load <laughs> goes up, we can eat more easily spread things in a moist environment or a more humid environment or a warmer environment. Right in a cooler environment, that's we just don't want it to get too cold in there, so we threw that in there too. But in those environments where those temperatures are warmer, uh, that's a pro that could be problematic from spreading disease or you know COVID, for example. But it's also problematic for facilities just to know that the temperature is too warm in that room. Right. Go ahead. Well, and, and let me give you another really good example, and I kind of preface this in the beginning. Yeah. Again, another school I was associated with, and this is a completely true story. Friday, everyone goes home a spider got inside a refrigeration unit. That's where all the food was stored. It shut down over the weekend at some point, it shut down the entire freezer unit, thousands. We're talking thousands of dollars of food gone. So you have all these students on campus waiting to eat, no food. Oof. And that's something that you walk back into. So now it's not just the cost of the repair, it's also the cost of going out and having to get food, getting staff to go out and cover this, right? Now you have a mess on your hands and those sensors are minimal expense at best. Uh, right. And again, you'd be getting those alerts on any device. Uh, and again, it's one of those things where you say, how do we provide a better experience for anyone involved? Uh, and, and air quality has become such a massive debate and conversation, especially in educational institutions. We've literally seen schools that have said, we were told we have to pay X hundreds of thousands of dollars to remediate or we put sensors in to monitor the air quality and it's a no brainer because the savings is astronomical. It's absolutely right. So this particular sensor, this is a sensor in our conference room. There's two things I wanna show you here. One, we track the data. Here's our limits for our alerts. They're on the page. We can show that that's been staying right in the limit, but look, 77.7 .7 is pretty warm in that conference room. Sun's coming in through the window, air conditioner's not kicking on. So we're right on the borderline. But the other thing from a network administration standpoint is my sensor has been unreachable for 16 hours. Now I would have gotten an alert right away that that sensor has been offline. Now, my guess, since this is a test is that we are actually working on that sensor, uh, playing with it. Someone's in there tweaking things, or they just turned it off for this demo. So I can show you that we see when the sensors go to alert, but you can quickly see that the data stops and we get an alert that the sensor is not working. When I look at that, I see that right here in my dashboard. That's that same sensor and I just get a little red light. So I know if my sensor is working or if I'm not. So not only to Jared's point, do we create an alert profile for the spider that got in the refrigeration, we watch all those refrigerators turn off and short out, right? But we get an alert that the sensor's offline too. Something's wrong and we get to know about it immediately because we have these sensor, these alert profiles built in. So let's take a look at a water sensor. I'm going to find one here. I believe, there we go. We have the fifth floor coffee bar and we have a water sensor. And what this sensor does, now I can actually even show you the camera, but what this sensor does is this monitors moisture, physical moisture on a surface. So on, uh, and I don't have any of the sensors on me and, and um, my engineer, Evan, who you'll get to meet if you want to follow up on this, he has them at his house, but they're, they're no bigger than this pad of paper right? Sensor is no bigger than this pad of paper. And this particular sensor that we're looking at here, which has no activity whatsoever, means that we haven't seen any water for the last day. Let's see if we've seen anything for the last 30 days, any activity for the last 30 days. So no events found in selected time period. That means we have not detected water by that sensor in the last 30 days, right? Terrible example, but no data is good data in this case. 
So if we come down here, we can look at, for example, this sensor. Now this is showing us the door open position and we can see that a door has been open or closed, right? And when it was. And now again, last 30 days, no openings to most frequent openings. So on this day, the door was open from eight, uh, between eight and 12. If I click on that, I can actually see that it was left open for a period of time. This is why this is important. If that door is an outside door and it's 30 degrees outside, and that's leading to my boiler room. That's leading to my um, to one of my classrooms that has hydronic heating in it. That means that that room, that temperature in that room, even if I don't have a temperature sensor, could drop down. I can get an alert. I can set an alert profile that says if a door is left open for more than three minutes to send me an alert, and I can go get that door closed right away to prevent those pipes from freezing, to prevent that room from getting snow in it, you know, making sure maybe this door blew open. We don't know. Now, what's really interesting about this, when I go back to those profiles, is I can even set a schedule so that I don't get, here, let me hop over to my alert profiles. Just give me two seconds here. So uh, sensor alert status, here's my conference room alert profile. So I'm going to go back to that one, and I'm going to say above or below, but here I've got this scheduled button. And I can actually change the schedule and I can say only alert me in these time periods. So if it's during the day and it's a teacher's, uh, it's a lab or a classroom and the teacher wants to leave that door open, they can, but at night I can get alerted on it. So that way I'm not getting alerts when I shouldn't. One of the biggest things when it comes to security, maintenance, all these different things is being alerted to death where we just stop, stop paying attention. If I get a million texts on my phone from something, from the same thing, I'm just going to silence it and never listen. So we give you the ability to craft the information in that communication so that it makes the most amount of sense for those users on the other side of the coin. Go ahead, Jared. Like I have a question for you. Can I tie these two things together, sensors and in cameras? Absolutely. Meaning That's if, I mean, because, right, we, we know that sometimes it's it, you, you have options in terms of the cameras that you're buying. But let's That's say right. I've got one facing down a hallway, but yet let's say there's an air sensor triggered and uh, it, it's something as simple as vaping, right? It's That's not right. supposed to be happening. All of a sudden the alert goes off. Can I can the camera then swing and pick up what that activity might be in that general vicinity? Yeah. So if I look at... Um, Coffee bar, fifth floor. Remember we talked about that that water leak detection, right? So this is the this is our 360 degree camera, um, and it's going to pull up a real time stream. And we've got the water sensor. Oop. Let me see if I can find a better view. Change view, and we're going to do. Yeah, we'll leave this, and then I can I should be able to move this. There we go. So right here next to the sink is our water sensor. If that water sensor were to go off, right? Oh, there's the sink right there. So if that water sensor right there were to go off and let's see, I'm trying to, I don't have full control over this camera because I'm not an official viewer. But if I had the ability to rotate this because it doesn't look like this, it actually will show you the full thing. If that camera were to go off, I could zoom in automatically on that spot where that sensor goes off send that alert and send this video clip all in the same uh, email to the person. So they'd actually get to see a video of that fifth floor coffee bar sink overflowing. Let me take a non, um, non 360 degree view. So here we go. So I can mm -hmm. use this camera here again. Here's my coffee bar. There's my sink, right? And then if this sink overflows or whatnot, this camera would zoom in on that and be able to send this directly to me. Now that's being done today, great point. That's being done today through our APIs, right? So remember we talked about, can we do it in the dashboard or is it more advanced than we do it in the APIs? Coming out in February, we're actually going to have the ability to tie those sensors directly into the cameras right through the dashboard. So you'll be able to program that, just select the sensor, select the camera, highlight a zone, and set up your alert all through the dashboard to, uh, starting in February. So that's a great question. How are we doing on time? I think we have about two minutes left. So listen, there's a lot here. We've gone over cameras and sensors and we've only had a half an hour and there's so much more to cover. Mm -hmm. If this is something that's really interesting to you, or if you wanna know more about kind of the ease of use, the management, 
the scalability, how we can use these in different ways inside your environments, Jared's the guy to reach out to. We can set up a meeting. We can certainly do a deeper dive demo. We can speak directly to your use cases, right? So for Office of General Services, the state of New York, we've been talking to them about putting air quality sensors and environmental sensors in every single one of their boiler rooms so they can detect volatile organic, organic comp compounds, particulate matter, know if there's, for example, a leak in one of their exhaust pipes for their boilers and understand if there's water on the ground because they aren't in their 750 facilities throughout the state of New York every day, right? We can get those sensors in place to understand what's happening in your different rooms. We can even, do, these were designed initially to be in your data center. Is your data center door being left open? Is your floor flooded? Is the temperature correct? We have all of those sensors. So we can start with technology and work our way out or we can look at facilities. And then you tie that in with the camera, which by the way, acts as the base stations for these sensors as well as the wireless. And you tie those in with visual, the visual aspect, and now you've got a full view of what's happening in your environment. So if that's of interest to you, Jared's email address is on the screen right now. Jared, do you want to say anything else in closing? It, no, uh, I just, I do want to bring your attention to a question that did come in. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, basically, uh, I have a, 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 an environment that has multiple technologies currently looking yep. to move towards a singular technology. How will uh, Meraki play uh, in an environment that isn't currently all Cisco or Meraki? Sure, absolutely. So the way that these sensors work, great question. The way that these sensors work is there's two types of base stations for these sensors, right? The camera itself can be a base station. Everything communicates through Bluetooth or Zigbee Z-Wave, right? And, and, but it's our, you have to do it through our dashboard. So, so either the camera or the wireless access point will act as that base station. Um, you only need one of those for every so many feet. So we can talk about physical architecture and where you need to place those. And then you can place as many sensors as you want. Everything, again, communicates to that base station. So in a hybrid environment, we can certainly take all of the Meraki data into the Meraki dashboard. And then what we would do is we could leverage the API to get that data out into a different platform if you wanted a migration path. If you are saying, listen, I want to put, I've got no sensors everywhere, but I've got, you know, somebody else's wireless. Um, we'll play, place those cameras or a single access point in each of those areas and you can start using those sensors today. So it really is an architecture conversation, but it's totally feasible to, to do a hybrid model while you migrate from one system to a singular system, multiple systems to a singular system. Which is helpful too, because a lot of times money isn't there to do a blanket uh, refresh of something. And so being able to kind of go hybrid for a little bit, uh, no pun intended, is certainly helpful. And without getting too far into the depths of the detail, the second question uh, that I'm looking at, uh, let's say someone wants to explore grants, right? Uh, what what funds course. exist out there? Uh, I, I know uh, you have a colleague, uh, Tony, uh, who, who certainly is uh, capable, but tell, tell me a little bit about grants. Yeah, sure. There's all sorts of grants out there. I'm sure... Um... Uh, you know, higher ed, ESSER, the ESSER grants have been a big deal. ARPA funding has been a big deal. Um, even the infrastructure bill is coming down um, mm -hmm. with grants for higher ed, especially for IoT, right? It's for understanding that infrastructure that you've got on campus and how that's going to work. So um, like Jared said, uh, Aspire and, and Cisco can get together with you. We can explore the need. We would build the solution and then see what grant money applies to fulfill that need. And there's different creative ways of doing it, whether if you throw the cameras in there for physical security, now we're looking at, can we use safety, campus safety and security money to help you deploy an environmental sensor setup? So we can get really creative with this grant structure. Uh, Vince and Tony uh, on the Cisco team, plus the Aspire team, we can certainly get there and, and search where we can find some of that funding. And also, it, there's a lot here, right? Uh, someone wants to find out more. Let's say, yeah, I'm, I'm interested, uh, or even I've already got something uh, installed. How do I learn more? Where, where can I go to learn more about Meraki? Sure. Uh, one of the best resources right now, honestly, is um, our new website. Meraki just got updated, so you can go to Meraki, uh, meraki.cisco.com, or you can go to meraki.com and we'll bring you to that page. Um, tons of information on there. YouTube is great. Um, there's all sorts of videos that our engineers make. Um, just make sure you go to the Meraki page um, and you can see all, all sorts of what we do. Or again, um, Aspire is a fantastic partner that we work with on a regular basis. They've got a team of engineers that are trained on Meraki. Um, but if you're in New York and you wanna learn more about it, myself, 
my engineer, Evan, Monica and Scott who are on the call, Jared and his team, we're all local resources that are here for you um, for kind of that one-on-one -on -one conversation. So, you know, and I just want to make a point, and this is the point that I always make uh, when it comes to Cisco and Meraki, we're talking about a product set. And if you notice, look at the, the volume of support that's here from Cisco from Meraki. Uh, I've worked with Evan before. He did a presentation with me uh, and just the depth of knowledge, but you have a tremendous support base behind you. Uh, and so I think that that's something uh, that really is, is imperative as we move forward into all of these new technologies, having a team behind you that can come in and support you uh, so that you don't lose any connectivity is really, really important or you know, you're not losing functionality. So uh, again, please reach out. A lot of great information. Mike, you've once again set the bar for product sales people, uh, you know, across the board. Uh, I'd also like to point out that I too uh, will be going to my coffee bar uh, after this, which is also my kitchen. Uh, so maybe I can put a sensor in there. But uh, again, appreciate the time. I appreciate everything that Meraki brings to the table and all the support they've provided. So I look forward to having further conversations. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.